So we have a special promotion going on here in February. This is our diesel tablet. This was just launched last year. This is our mid-range diagnostic tool. It will do thousands of the most common diagnostic commands. So if you're working on your EGR system, you're trying to change engine parameters, you're trying to work on your SCR system, this will do the resets, the calibrations, the installs, all the things. You can one tap to repair information to get instant repair information for all your fault codes. It's a great, great tool to put inside your shop and it's priced very, very aggressively for the price point. And in February, we have a special promotion going on. So if you buy this tool in February and there's a limited amount, you will get five free online training courses. So these online training courses are not about the tool. These courses are about how to do electrical, how to troubleshoot after treatment systems, how to do all this advanced stuff that you need to know for today's commercial truck. So it's a $500 value, comes absolutely free with the product for the month of February. Check it out, 30 day money back guarantee. We know you're gonna love it. We sold a ton of these things already. Hey guys, welcome to Overhauled with the Diesel Queen. I am here today with two guests, one of which you guys have already seen. Today I am here with Elsa and her father, Hank. Hank, you're a mechanic, correct? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you guys introduce yourselves again, well, you again, and you for the first time, and kind of explain what your background is a little bit and why you want to be here today, because I know you have a very specific topic you want to talk about. This is my second podcast with Melissa, and I am in high school right now, and I want to be a diesel mechanic when I'm older. Um, I want to work on heavy equipment just because I think it's cooler. Um, I got my start from my grandpa and dad and my brother, and they kind of just got me pulled into engines and stuff like that. And I tinker in the shop right now, but not on equipment or not on diesel equipment, just on like small engines and stuff like that. And I'm Hank and uh, I had a computer networking business for 22 years and then retired from that. I have a small engine repair business now. Okay. For the past so do, three you, years. do you run that then? Oh yeah, I run the business. It's a one man show besides also helping out in the shop. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, do you want to go ahead and explain to everybody kind of, I know you have a very specific topic you want to talk about today. Do you want to kind of cover what that is and, and why you wanted to cover it on the podcast? Yeah. So uh, I have read and researched a bunch about uh, the right to repair. And this was a big topic uh, many years ago, also in the, the IT industry with of course, Apple and Microsoft and some of the others. Uh and I believe, in, and it's become a bigger issue in the heavy equipment and uh, repair uh, world. So uh, I wanted to get your opinion on it and have a little discussion and hopefully raise a little bit more uh, information about the right to repair. All right. So, yeah, that's that's actually a really controversial, controversial thing that has been going around. Uh, I come from a dealership side obviously right so you know the the right to repair is kind of an interesting topic and it's i i can take both sides on it almost and that's going to sound really weird for a lot of the people listening so like oh my god I, you should be pro probably 100 percent right to repair right you fix your own stuff well yes i do but uh you know and i'm all for it, fixing your own stuff right I held a banquet for all these like big fancy people that were somehow a part of it i don't know i just showed up because i was told to show up and we we're supposed to talk to these people about the right to repair and i'm not going to really discuss what we were supposed to talk about because i just mentioned the name of the company which i probably should have done but um they we held a whole dinner for them and everything and kind of showed them around the shop and what i kind of learned is the right to repair some people have some kind of skewed imagery of what that is, right? So so John Deere, for example, already sells. You, you can already buy all of the specialty tools as a customer, and you can you can buy all the manuals. Uh, you can buy service advisor. There is a customer version. There is that is missing like. I don't think you can do a, comp a computer reprogram 
on the computer version. There are certain certain things that are missing on the computer, on the customer version of the computer program called Service Advisor. But what I did learn, which was an interesting thing, is some of these people don't want to just be able to to fix their own machines because I'm all for that, right? I have a 20 year old goddamn pickup truck in the driveway that I fucking fight on a daily basis. And I would love to have access to fucking all data for that. I would love it. But some of these people are, they, they want to be able to go in and change engine parameters, right? They want to go in and change their, they think they can change all their horsepower ratings and stuff. Some of these people are asking under the right to repair law and some of this right to repair um vision around what what right to repair is that they think they can just have these computer programs that can go in and turn up their engine power and i don't know how much you know about you know engine software and dealership access to engine software but most dealerships don't even have access to that we can't do that we can't upload anything to an ecm without John Deere's approval and John Deere has to send it to us in a little upload package. And then we, you know, the computer does the rest of it. So that's, it's, it's a, it's a gray area with the right to repair for me. Cause it's, you know, there's a lot of it's already available to customers. A, a lot of this computer programming is all already available to customers, but it's freaking expensive. Like service advisor for customers is insanely expensive and I don't necessarily agree with how expensive it is, but that's kind of my take on it. I'd be interested to hear what your take is on that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, the reason that I'm kind of for right to repair is because I want to work on my own stuff, Yeah. but like, also I feel like it should be the owner's yeah. choice to say, hey, yeah, I do want to maybe not be so sure about what I'm fixing, but try it anyway, versus paying more at a dealer or something like that to get it fixed the correct way the first time. And I think that if the owner wants to take that gamble, they can. Yeah. Um, Because I know you worked on the dealership side and you had to fix a lot of mess ups. Um, So I know how that is. You know, we've been there, but like, I think it should be your own gamble if you want to take that or not but so let's i'd like to expand on what you said about the cost uh it being cost prohibitive to have those tools to work on um the computers and stuff like that and so you, i did some research in germany they have provisions now in their uh proposed legislation that says that there has to be uh, a, a certain limit on the cost of what these tools can be Mm -hmm. so that they're not just making these these uh hurdles to repair just financial or also with the access to parts they're, yeah. they're trying to do it that way so um there's a lot of facets to the right to repair uh and you've already brought up several of them uh i just don't I, we already have a model in the automotive and light truck industry of how um, we can still be allowed to repair things uh, and still have I should, the right to repair things. Uh, and, but the, then the, the manufacturers also still have control of their product. Yeah. Which I heard is part of the problem Diesel. for some of So yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Germany because uh, working is actually made in Germany and they're, this is kind of off topic, but they're a parts advisor, service advisor, like computer programs are linked, which is really fucking awesome for working products. And you can be in a service manual or a pair of manual and it will tell you what the parts are like in the little diagrams for like a valve body and it'll have little part numbers in it and it'll have a link to the fucking parts book which is pretty fucking sick. Or you can be in the parts book and click a part and it'll take you right to the theory of operation for that part. It's pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, that's but pretty great. That's, 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 I was really hoping when John Deere bought work and that they were going to get on board with that and kind of, you know, learn from them, but that did not happen. So, 
but yeah, it's the cost is, and that's the one thing with John Deere. Then I, I can only speak on John Deere, right? Because that's really what are my experiences. But Ed, sir, they've made it so it's so fucking expensive that nobody can really afford it. Like, and even the specialty tools, all of our specialty tools are made by OTC, and OTC is a de- decent brand, but you go and buy their service guard, you know, their service guard JDG part number for anything. And it's freaking insane. Like their, their front main seal installers are insane. Their injector pullers are insane. I have a set of pins for timing a 13, five. It has two pins and then it's got a the feeler gauges for also doing the valve adjustment are like this big. Cause so you have to pin it cause it's an overhead cam. You have to pin it in that engine and then run the valve adjustments that way and the that like little tiny feeler gauge things it's a little kit i bought you know it's got the block pin and the cam pin and the little feeler oh. gauges and that cost me like 250 bucks 300 dollars just for that and then it took me like three months to get it so yeah, see, that's what we have a problem with when there's not competition in the repair side of it that you don't have other people, other businesses making the tools mm-hmm. or allowed to make the tools or allowed to make even a better tool than maybe they yep. offered. Yeah. So if we get rid of that competition, which is what the uh, anti uh, right to repair folks, you know, they want to lock it down. And it's just, I think, just a profit motive. Now I want all the businesses to succeed. I, I don't want to make it cost prohibitive or make it so that they have to have pot- pass a cost on to uh, the buyers of the equipment uh, because it's so hard to develop these, these things. But um, me personally, I, I come from a small business background. I don't come from a dealerships or, or, or corporate. And uh, I think that, you know, the competition is what keeps the, the cost of uh, equipment and tools lower. If, if you don't have the competition, then it just, the, those prices are abnormally high for those things. I agree. I agree completely on that. And it's, you know, I not only did I spend an insane amount of money on two timing pins and a set of tiny feeler gauges, but it took me three or four months to get those. And I was working at the dealership. I ordered those through the parts department at the dealership as an employee. And I got an employee discount too. So it's, You know, I've bought actually a couple specialty tools from OTC, from John Deere, because, you know, you go to some shops and especially with that particular tool set I bought, I got really fucking tired. This is shop like 25 mechanics. I got really fucking tired of every single time I needed them. They weren't in the fucking bin and trying to track down a feeler gauge set that's that big because they're real tiny. No, fuck that. So I got really tired of trying to track it down. So I just bought my own. Um, I've got a couple other OTC or service guard tools here and there that I've bought myself. Like I got like their little slide hammer. They have this really sick slide hammer. That's got a little self-tapping screw you can put in. And then it's like, a, it's four seals, which it works fucking awesome. And I love it, but that's not the point of the story. Point of the story is it takes that one. I think took like six months for me to get that one took forever. And all it is is a little slide hammer, you know, but I don't know. It's even from a dealership standpoint, it takes forever to get this stuff and it's expensive, let alone from a customer standpoint. So it's, you know, I kind of have always had the theory of if you take care of your customers, even if you are offering them a little bit more help than maybe you should, guess who they're going to go to when they fuck it up or they can't figure it out or they need help. You know, they're going to go to the person that helped them or tried to help them. Um, I used to fight with one of my bosses about helping customers over the phone. And, you know, I've always told them like, dude, I'm going to do everything I can to help them over the phone. They need a code pulled up. I'll help them. They, they need a, uh, general direction to go to in a diagnostic i'll help them we had one guy that had a greater ripped apart he had the tandems off and he couldn't get the tandems back on the one side all the way to get the snap ring in the groove because there's a big there's so elsa and 
for you guys, kind of a visual. Greater axles are a big inboard planetary axle system, and they have big axle shafts coming out the ends, kind of like tractors do. Uh, and the tandem slide is that the big, the tandem housing is the big chain housing that both the wheels are on, right? And there's a sprocket inside of it, and that sprocket that's hooked to the chains, that's hooked to the wheel ends, slides right over that axle shaft. And then there's a snap ring that retains it. Well, he called us one time. He's like, man, I can't get this snap ring on. I can't get this tandem to be pushed far enough in to get the snap ring in. And we're like, how do I, I mean, you can try this and this and that, like, but don't, you know, don't beat on it too much. But like, you know, that's, that snap ring should go in. There should not be anything that is stopping that. Uh, I've done a ton of tan greater tandems because their original seals were junk and they leak grease all the fucking time. I have done so many greater tandems. I'm like, dude, I, I honestly have never ran into that issue. But I looked it up in the manual and I tried to find things for him and I spent like an hour on the phone with him. And eventually he just, he's like, well, I'm going to get it together enough to drive it to you. So that's what he did is he got it back together enough and drove it to us. And long story short, they did not assemble it correctly. And that's why it was, you know, not going on all the way. And they beat the dog piss out of the axle shaft end so much with a hammer that uh, that needed to be replaced. But they were thankful that, you know, I helped them to the best of my ability with what I could do over the phone. And they were thankful enough that they were like, you know, I'm going to bring it to you. I'm good with that. You know, you tried to help me. And I think that's kind of the same thing with the right to repair is, you know, one thing you're paying it for at a dealership, it's not just the dealership has the specialty tools. It's not just because dealerships have service advisors. It's not just because they have the parts system breakdowns. It's also the years of experience of the mechanics, you know, the, the shit they've seen over and over and over again that you know, the diagnostics they've done over and over and over again. So I'm kind of a firm believer of like, let these people try to fix it themselves. And if they can, great. I do it all the time on my truck, right? I have 20, I have fucking five trucks and one of them runs. I know all about that. You know, let people try to fix their own shit, give them the tools and give them the opportunity and give them the resources to fix it. And when they need help or they can't figure it out, guess who they're going to take it to? The people that tried to help them and tried to give them the resources to do it themselves. So to me, helping out a customer in that sense is kind of a win-win situation. But some people don't necessarily agree with me and think I shouldn't be helping customers at all on the phone. So it's really dealer dependent. Yeah, we used to have that. I was a service writer more than 20 two years ago and we would have people wanting this to help them fix the car over the phone. This was an independent garage, only six mechanics. Mm -hmm. And they would ask to have, you know, ask for codes or, you know, what we thought about this or that. And sometimes we would help them with it. Sometimes we wouldn't, but um, I, I think it's a customer service thing there. Um, mm -hmm. we, again, in the automobile industry, we were allowed to, you know, we had all data and, aftermarket service manuals and aftermarket tools to, to fix any of these vehicles. Um, sometimes you did have to go back to the dealer though. And yeah. the dealer has a, a, a place in the whole marketplace as far as, you know, some people just, you know, they're John Deere green or whatever they are. They just love it. And they just want to go to the dealer and get it done because they, they believe it'll get done right. And, uh, that that again, that competition between an independent garage and a dealership um, is a healthy competition, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That the the genuine or the the general uh, consensus of dealerships is that's where you take it. You know, you spend the extra money, and it's done right the first time, and it's done well. That's a general consensus of taking it to a dealership. As I have worked in a dealership, I have learned that it's not about being a dealership. It's about the quality of mechanics you have, because I have seen dealership mechanics uh, repair shit that looks like a shade tree mechanic in his backyard did it. So it's. <laughs> no. Is that you? No. 
Sometimes, not all cut, cut the fucking ends off your zip ties. Please. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have, if you have like little wiring harness clamps, and I know there's a billion of them. I know some of these wiring harnesses have like a billion little tiny clamps on them. It's okay. Do not put one of them on. But take the whole fucking clamp off. Don't just leave it there and then don't bolt it on. Just take the whole fucking clamp. That drives me nuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is actually coming from uh, um, Melissa, I've my got a question own experiences. For you. Yeah. I've got a question for you about your opinion. Uh, again, with the right to repair, uh, parts is an issue. So if in, the, again, I'll just use the automotive industry because people, a lot of people understand it. Uh, you can buy the spark plugs, air filters, the oil, all that stuff in the aftermarket or from the dealer. Uh, I was working on a, a Bobcat skid steer and it called for Bobcat fluid of some sort for the. I know what uh, you're talking I, about. Yeah. You know, and, yep. and I'm like, well, is there anything special to it? And you try to look up the uh, specifications for it and the the codes and all that, you know, uh, yeah, what do they call those? The SAE codes for it. And uh, I was like, well, I could use automatic transmission fluid or something, they said, but uh, maybe I should use the Bobcat stuff. And I just, I thought that was kind of weird when coming from automotive industry more than 30 years ago, all that stuff standardized, you know, it's. Yeah, uh, kind of. I, there's oil you get every now and then, like the, actually the manual transmission fluid in my fucking Second gen pickups is a very specific fluid. And don't ask me why, but it's fucking expensive, by the way. But it has Mopar on it and it says fucking, well, it says NV4500, even though it's an NV5600, but it works on all of the NV model transmissions. Yeah, we see that a lot in equipment. Um, I mean, obviously, John Deere, all their oil is all John Deere, but, but some people don't quite understand is these oils are very specific. Hydraulic oil in John Deere is not just hydraulic oil. There's three different hydraulic oils in John Deere. Actually four, if you count the machines that take engine oil as hydraulic oil. You know, you, we got High Guard, which is a general hydraulic oil. You can have it in tractors that also run, you know, a sump that is included in the transmission and the axles and the hydraulics is all one sump. You can run High Guard in that. You get in the construction side, and all the new stuff runs Hydra, which is a whole nother updated hydraulic fluid for these machines. You cannot run that in any machine that has already run High Guard, and you can not run that in any machine that is anything but that's your hydraulic system. You know, on, on loaders, for example, their hydraulics are Hydra, which is actually the replacement for plus 50 engine oil in the older loaders. And then the axles have high guard. Transmission has high guard, but the trans the oil or the hydraulic oil is separate, right? That's hydra. But hydra and high guard are two very different things. They're not cross compatible, and there you can't you cannot drain a system that has one of those in it and fill it up with the other and not have problems. It's, that's not going to be good. Uh, engine oil and hydra are backwards compatible, but then you have ex or. I think it's EX, it's it's EX 85, 65, uh, excavator oil. That's zinc-free oil. You, that's the only oil you can run. Excavators, don't ask me why, but excavators cannot run oil with zinc in it. So that's, coming from a dealership standpoint, it's, you know, I I understand why they make the specialty oils they do there's a reason they have them specialty right but what i don't understand is why it's so fucking expensive the bu the buckets of fucking uh hitachi excavator oil are is fucking insane um but i don't know it's coming from a dealership mechanic standpoint i would never want to put aftermarket oil in a machine uh, if I if I had a customer come in and they had some blue random hydraulic oil they got from Tractor Supply, I would 
offer to change that oil out and change all their filters just because, you know, the dealerships and the manufacturers of these companies know what to put in their oil. They know what works best. And that is your best option. That is my, in my opinion, that is your best option is to use the oil that that manufacturer provided for that machine for that purpose. Same with filters. I, I have seen a customer blow up two 13 fives in a row because he refused to buy John Deere air filters and he bought Napa ones. Then it took two of them to figure this out, right? The first one, you could tell it was dusted. And we're like, well, we weren't really sure it was under warranty or no, he had to pay for that one. No, that one was under warranty. The first one was under warranty, but it looked like it was dusted. And at first we're like, man, like, I don't know. Well, we send it through John Deere, right? And the warranty process takes forever. They ask for the engine back. They ask for all this stuff. Well, turns out the customer then dusts later on down the road, dusts another engine, blows up another one. Doesn't blow it up, but fucks up another 13.5 in his loader. This is in that process, John Deere figures out that the Napa air filter that they were using on this machine doesn't actually seal to the housing correctly. Oh, wow. So they yeah. trashed two engines because they were too cheap to buy John Deere filters. Now I'm not saying that's the solution for everything. Obviously, you know, you get to the automotive side and I, I always buy the Mopar filter with a little Cummins symbol on it for the oil filter for my truck. I always buy that. But you go to like a normal parts store and there is no Mopar air filter or Mopar mm-hmm. fuel filter. And speaking from experience, the Mopar ones at the dealership are quite a bit more expensive. So I do agree that I think it would be better if they would drop that price a little bit just to make sure that shit was done right. And, you know, things like oil and air filters and things for the lubrication system, that is so fucking important. That that can make or break your entire fucking machine. And I don't necessarily agree with it being so expensive, but it's, I don't know if that's kind of what you're going on, but what, I don't know if yeah. what's your thoughts on that. The, the filters are, are well, any of those consumables that, that uh, that's a rec- recurring cost for the equipment owner. And uh, there should be a spec that the uh, filter manufacturer should follow. And if they say, well, it, it meets the spec for this, say the, the Mopar air filter for your pickup. Uh, if it meets the spec, then it should still be good. Now we've, I think we've all seen those videos on the internet about the oil filter things. The guys take apart the oil filters and they say, oh, this one has this and not that and all these things. So I think that the specification should be made public uh, as part of uh, the manufacturing, the manufacturers support their their machines. Uh, but to say, oh, you have to use John Deere filters, I, I just don't, I don't buy it. Because then again, we're trying to get they're trying to get rid of the competition, which brings the lower prices. Um, well, they're trying to sell their parts, right? Yeah, yeah. But if there's a spec, a specification saying that that the oil filter has to have this uh, pop off, uh, this uh, number of pleats in the filter, or whatever, or has to filter some certain mic- micron measurement, um, is if it meets OEM spec. And that used to be a term we used to have a lot in the automotive world. Uh, then it's good enough. It's it's then that, then that's a viable part. But uh, as we're seeing now in uh, again the automotive industry, we are people are buying parts off eBay that are substandard. They're they're no good. They're coil ignition coils that are no good, or all kinds of stuff. Turbos, all this crazy stuff. And again, that's where. I think the manufacturer can say, well, this is a spec and these parts don't meet spec. Ours do, and they can use it as a a marketing thing. But uh, just to say you only can use our stuff uh, is not, I don't feel is is acceptable to society and and is outside the right to repair. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
I just, as of right now, though, you know, I have seen firsthand what happens when you don't use dealership stuff. And Napa claims to be OEM spec, and that filter was obviously not OEM spec. It was just, yeah. it was just enough to not be OEM spec that it fucking trashed two engines that are like seventy five thousand dollars a piece. So it's it's kind of one of those. I do I wish coming from a person that owns my own stuff. Do I wish there was a cheaper option to the exact Mopar filters and exact specs? Absolutely. And this goes down to all the parts. You know, my boyfriend has a 2015 Challenger that I did a video on on YouTube about the wheel speed sensor. And he had a wheel speed sensor code. I did my diagnostics. I'm like, yeah, it's definitely the sensor. So we go to the dealership because I already know Mopar hates aftermarket electronics. So this is just from my experience. I've had bad experience with aftermarket electronics on Mopar. So we go to the dealership. It's closed. I'm like, well, we need to get this fixed today. So we take the chance and go to O'Reilly's and we go and buy the wheel speed sensor and it's like $60. Go and put it on. Doesn't make a fucking difference. And I'm like, I know I diagnosed this. I know I diagnosed this right. I know I did. So I did the little swap Gnostics and I put the left side on the right and the right side on the left. And the problem followed the sensor. And I'm like, well, this is why I don't buy aftermarket OE or aftermarket parts for fucking Mopar. Go down to the dealership that has one. Spend $180 on the same sensor that looks exactly the same. Plug mm -hmm. it in. I don't know what inside of it is different, but you plug it in and you put it on that car and it likes it and it's fine. It's happy and it's fixed. Don't ask me what like 110 $120 difference in a fucking sensor made, but that was frustrating. So, you know, I get that. And especially from a shop standpoint, like an independent shop standpoint, that's a cost on you guys too. You know, if you guys put an aftermarket part on it, that's not, oh, that's not, doesn't meet spec, right. And it doesn't fix it. And you have to go to the dealership and buy another one. You probably have to eat that part, that original part. So yeah, you probably have to eat the cost of that. So yeah, I definitely understand that. I um, could we talk about um, used parts market with the with the in relation to the right to repair? Because that's in the mean, German. Like, how do you mean? That's in the German spec. Yeah. How do you mean used parts? So yeah, the in the 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 German government's interpretation of the right to repair, they wanted to facilitate. Uh, the used part market. Uh, and I think it was mostly referring to electronics as in cell phones and that kind of stuff. But uh, when I was growing up, of course, I'm an old guy, but, uh, you know, we had lots of junkyards and stuff. And there was junkyards for tractor trailers and heavy equipment and stuff, too. And, and with, I'm going to guess, the environmental um, rules and also uh, there being less hands-on folks out in the world, uh, there's less junkyards, scrapyards for used parts. And in again, in Germany, they're trying to encourage that market to come back. Um, and, you know, I've bought used parts off eBay or other, you know, Facebook or whatever. And uh, you get some decent OEM parts sometimes. Uh, I don't know that that's totally not applicable to dealerships. They're not going to put used parts in, but a small time... Yeah. Uh, mechanic. We have a friend from Wyoming that fixes tractor trailers and he buys old parts, you know, f especially some that are unavailable um, off the used market. And if we don't embrace the used market, then we won't have that resource for repair. Well, dealerships struggle with that too. Um, I've especially working in Wyoming have ran across a lot of ancient shit and you know, there's at one point you know, I've ran into like ancient back when John Deere made fucking scrapers, right? No one, no one, I didn't know. The first time my boss told me he's bringing me in a scraper to work on. And this was at uh, the green dealership back in the day. It's like, oh yeah, one of the farmers he's bringing in, uh, or this guy has like, I think he's got like a feedlot or something. He's like, he's bringing in a scraper. 
my first envisionment is cool. I get to work on one of those stupid pole behind scraper pans. Awesome. Then it shows up and it's this whole ass fucking machine. It looks like a little mini cat scraper. I'm like, that's fucking cool. That thing had a contamination issue, a hydraulic contamination. So bad to the point where I had to replace or and or clean out and rebuild every hydraulic and hydrostatic component on that machine. And I tell you what, trying to find fucking parts and gaskets for that fucking ancient thing, this was an A, I think, or B. It wasn't quite as ancient as, like, the one I worked at Hanan, which was, like, literally John Deere made a tractor that was yellow and then bolted a scraper pan onto it. That was odd. I, that looked weird. That was weird. This one was just a two. That one was, like, it was literally a four-wheel, like, ag tractor ancient ag tractor with a scraper pan but this other one was like a full on you know it only has two wheels in the front straight up looks like a cat scraper and so i had to replace i also did the axle on that i took the axle all the way out did the brakes and everything for that we had to use what we called vintage parts which is an online website that sells uh equipment parts and they a lot of it's a lot of times are refurbished right but these people go around and they find machines And they pull shit off of them and they refurbish them to the best of their abilities. But that machine was a fucking nightmare to try to get. It was cool and I loved it and it was kind of awesome. But from just the I love equipment shit standpoint, but trying to fucking put parts on that motherfucker, I had to. That was the machine that I learned how to make my own gaskets on because there was some gaskets I did not know that wasn't even available. And Elsa, I don't know if you've made your own gasket yet, but. There was like this whole, like all the old mechanics have this really cool, like way to do it that makes it look beautiful and perfect. And I promise yours is not going to look like that the first time you do it. It's going to look like some two-year-old trying to cut your gasket out. But um, that was, that was one of my first experiences with machines that needed used parts or aftermarket parts. I mean, I grew up in fucking with old shit. I spent so much time in a fucking junkyard. It's not even funny. Like, I I, I can't tell you how much shit I robbed off of stuff in junkyards for my trucks and stuff. But piece of equipment standpoint, vintage parts was really, like, the only option we had. And if they didn't have it, we were kind of fucked. And it was kind of like taking it apart and cleaning it and praying that it's okay. And this thing was heavily contaminated. So I would love to see junkyards like that. Obviously, though, you need the bodies and the people to do that. And unfortunately, there's already a technician shortage in this industry for all the shops, let alone more businesses popping up trying to, you know, do junkyards, which I think would be awesome. You know, I've sent machines to junkyards before. Don't know where the junkyard is. Uh, When I worked at the Four Rivers in Colorado, in Fort Collins, uh, we had an excavator that came in that broke the fucking turntable like the entire fucking turntable you could reach up in the bottom and pull out the little bearing things it was complete it wasn't just the bearing too it was the housing like completely fucking broke that thing went to the fucking scrapyard don't know where the scrapyard is but i would like to because that is i I, as dealership standpoint we would only use vintage parts or in like industrial injection, you rebuild injectors and refurbish injectors and injection parts and shit like that. Um, but as far as a small business operator or maybe just an owner, fuck yeah, let's have more junkyards. I'd be down for that. If I owned a piece of equipment and I was struggling, I would much rather be able to go to a junkyard and I mean, it's a gamble, right? But yeah, I don't have a problem with junkyards i'm surprised germany has junkyards they they have a problem with getting rid of stuff like it, you can you know re uh, uh reuse or, or uh, uh you know recycle iron and stuff like that but all these plastic parts and mixed parts they can't recycle very well and they don't have the space to just have a, a dump like we do yeah so we just you know so they have yeah. all these and it might be a cultural thing too with them i don't know but um they they want to 
and their their version of a, a a used parts is it's a warehouse where they actually took it apart and put it on the shelves and labeled that's it what vintage that. parts is yeah okay yeah that's yeah and i think that's going to be the modern version of a, a junkyard you know a used parts place it's not going to be like when i was a kid where i just walk out in this old field where they had a bunch of dodge pickups and i go get pieces you know that's yep. that, that probably won't happen too much longer but as far as the stock stuff and if they can make again if they can make money they'll they'll do it i guess um but then they have the environmental hurdles uh to to adhere to like everybody else but uh ilsa's had a bunch of used parts on her pickup truck <laughs> well my truck came from a junkyard yeah so <laughs> nice you know. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, David and honestly, wife. Yeah. It's honestly like my favorite thing is just, just go to that junkyard and just look around. And that's where I, I found used my to love that too. You can find so yeah. much cool shit in a junkyard. Yeah. I, I, I'm such a fucking redneck when it comes to junkyards. I fucking love them. I, we used to go all the fucking time. Yeah. It's, I, I love junkyards. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find all kinds of shit in there that you can use for like everything right you, you can never walk into a junkyard and only take what you were originally going there for actually you're probably not going to find what you originally were going there for but you're going to go home with a fucking giant car to shit <laughs> mm -hmm. i've gotten yeah. engines from junkyards axles from junkyards yeah I, I don't have an issue with junkyards at all now do I fully trust stuff from junkyards? Probably not. But whatever. Yeah, it's just enough, right so it's in care. <laughs> yeah. I I got a I took a transmission. Uh I had a white 1500 uh 991500 that I have lifted on like 35 inch tires. It's so it's like a fucking it's a giant fucking little redneck 1500 truck. I had to put 488 gears in the front and the rear just to get it to do highway speeds because I put giant fucking tires on an underpowered truck. My dad has it right now, but I got it stuck in a water puddle in Wyoming trying to go hunting. I wasn't even trying to off-road. I was trying to hunt. And I got stuck in what they call, what I later learned was the Jeep Eater. And I trashed my engine and because it was stuck in the water. And it the water got in through the seals and try my bearings were fucking copper. It didn't matter. I tried to save it. Didn't work. Anyways, a few months down the road, I learned, I figured out through a wonderfully loud noise and an explosion of my transmission that there was probably also water in my transmission. And I went to a junkyard and I pulled a used manual transmission out of that junkyard, didn't put oil in it, nothing. I just slapped that motherfucker into my truck and that is still in the truck. That was probably, I was your age. I was your age when I put, the, no, wait, I was not your age. I lied. I was 18. I was 18 when I put that in. And I am 26 now. So that used transmission from a junkyard has almost lasted 10 years. So. Heck yeah. Uh, Melissa, in the automotive world, they have, they passed the rule where the manufacturers had to provide parts for, I think, 10 years or something like that. Do they have that in heavy equipment? Uh, I think so, but I'd be lying to you if I knew the details on that. Um, I mean, John Deere supplies parts for, it's it's more of a, what's a common part? And, you know, if they're common parts, like fuel, in, fuel injectors, or I guess back in the day, nozzles, um, fuel pumps, shit like that, brakes. You can usually find that. Um, I've worked on a lot of old shit, and there has not been very many machines that I've had an issue with finding parts for. But every now, it's like it's usually like the little things, like gaskets. Can't get the fucking gasket for it. You can get the fucking entire valve body, but you can't get the goddamn gasket. Like, that's... The older you get, obviously, the harder it is to find parts for it. I don't know what the exact year is that they have to support, but for the most part, the only machines I've ever ran into an issue in for are, like, ancient. Like, 60s, 70s. Ancient. I think it, 
I think a lot of it depends on manufacturer, but I did. I just know that there is a minimum requirement for uh, car manufacturers. Um, I worked on a 58 BMW motorcycle and I was able to buy every part for that. Yeah. That was amazing. I couldn't believe it. But then I went to buy a part for, you know, one of these Yang Sang mopeds and you couldn't <laughs> get anything for it. You know, there's, there's toast. You, know, you could go eBay, maybe find something, but that's another part of the right to repair that was, that I've seen as a discussion point is actual part uh, availability. You can't fix it if you can't get the parts. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of aftermarket companies that do that, which back to, you know, what we are saying about how aftermarket is not always the greatest option because they don't meet specifications or whatever. You know, there's companies like um, LMC Truck that makes pretty much almost every kind of body panel or interior panel or cosmetic anything on old trucks. And I used to have the subscription for the second gen Dodges. But as far as like a uniform thing to get aftermarket parts, that's kind of hard. You know, it's what I've learned is if it's not a common issue, it's going to be really hard to find, mm-hmm. you know, an aftermarket part for it. If it's old, you know, like even my truck, my truck's not that old. It's only 20 years old. And I still have issues with like, there's a lot of shit on the engine in specific, even though it's Cummins, fucking Cummins trucks are fucking everywhere. Everybody wants a second gen goddamn Cummins. So everyone has a fucking 24 valve or a 12 valve. You cannot fucking find a lot of shit on that engine in a normal parts place. You have to either go online or you have to go to the dealership to find it. Because O'Reilly's, Napa, Advanced Auto, none of them sell it. One day I was looking for like a thermostat gasket. Couldn't fucking find it. I had to go to the dealership for it. That was fucking maddening. It's it's constant. Like every fucking goddamn thing I have to buy on that stupid engine, I have to go to the fucking manufacturer for. And trying to deal with Cummins where they ask for the serial number and all this other fucking, they need to know the fucking life history of your engine before they look up a part for you is fucking maddening. So I just go to Mopar. So you type in the VIN and they give it to you, but I don't know. I mean, that would require, I'm all for that, but that would require somebody to start that up and create that business. And then you need the infrastructure, right? The reason they, they have a limitation of 10 years is because to you, every new machine, a new vehicle that comes out has new different parts on it, right? You have to have an entire fucking assembly, an entire facility, and a manufacturing setting for those new parts. And eventually, you know, the old, the more and more machines you get down your line, if Caterpillar supplied parts for all their machines until they were like the first machines ever all the way up, you probably fill an entire fucking state full of fucking manufacturing buildings just trying to make all those parts. So it's not necessarily realistic to expect them to have the infrastructure to support parts. I mean, I wish it would go more like 20 years instead of 10 years, but I mean, I'd love to see the, it, there's just so many. I don't, I would love to see that. I just, I don't, I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around how that would be possible to have any company aftermarket or OEM that covers all makes and models of everything. and has every single part that has ever been created for that. Well, and that's part of the problem, I think with planned obsolescence of some of these parts. So why would any manufacturer across their product line have so many different oil filters. Really, we could probably have 10 oil filters cover everything. You know, it's it seems ridiculous to have every time we have a different model of skid steer, we have to have a different oil filter. It doesn't, that's kind of ridiculous. And, and the same with hydraulic pumps or injectors or whatever. You know, maybe if we came up with some standards 
and say, okay, well, you need something that flows this much. Use this injector. Don't don't remake it a whole different injector, which requires a whole slew of parts related to it. Why can't we just use the same injector we used in the seventies or the eighties? And I think that that's part of the planned obsolescence is to make it so that they're, you can't use any old injectors or old injector parts. It's a whole new version and and we don't have, then we won't have any used parts anymore. Because if if that injector only fits one motor, then there's no reason to stock it or manufacture it in the aftermarket or any of that stuff. And so in the IT world, the printer guys were doing that. They would make a printer and then that stupid ink cartridge only yeah. fit a couple of printers. And so they, it was a planned obsolescence thing. And that's, they, then you could only get that uh, ink thing from that one manufacturer. And that was bullshit. They, you know, it, it just held ink. It didn't have to be anything special. Um, yeah. I don't I mean, know. I, I, go ahead. It's, you know, I get where you're coming from with that, but I would rather try and make their shit better for the next machine than use shit that doesn't work the first time. Uh, John Deere is notorious for if it works really well, we're going to try to change it. But if it doesn't work that great, we're going to keep it. Don't ask me why. Like, but I have I know I talk shit on John Deere, but I love working for John Deere. But if it is efficient, makes sense, or makes it easier, they don't do it. That was always my thing with shit. Like, there's some fucking TikTok of this guy from John Deere, and he's got, he's taking this bolt out of something. I don't know what it is. And it's hitting the frame, right? And it does come out. And he's like, what the fuck, are engineers? Yeah, I know. But there is something about engineers that is good where if you have something like my second gen Dodge, for example, the fucking throttle position sensor is shit. And I'm so fucking thankful that they did not fucking carry that onto the next fucking 8,000 Cummins engines that came in those trucks because that thing is fucking junk. I hate that motherfucker. <laughs> but, it, and you know, it's, as technology this is what why mechanics get paid so much as technology gets better so are the electronic parts you know injectors in the 80s didn't need this is diesel injectors in the 80s weren't electronic the pump was electronic and the pump baby probably not actually that was probably all mechanical mechanical timing all of that your fuel pressures for a diesel in the 80s were nothing compared to the fuel pressures that they have today. But, you know, why they have such high fuel pressures? Because the fuel atomizes and it burns more efficiently. So it's better. So, but with things like oil filters, um, you know, I back to how I drive a second gen Dodge. Every fucking 5.9 Cummins has the same oil filter. Every fucking 5.9 Cummins, but same fucking oil filter. All the way through all the years. 12 valve. Well, original 12 valve, I believe. Then the second gen 12 valve. Then the 24 valve. Then the common rail 24 valve. I'll use the same oil filter. I do not know if six seven does. If it doesn't, I don't know why it doesn't. Um, with consumables, yeah, I can see that. Like fuel filters, you know, and oil filters, air filters. Why not make it universal? Why not make it something that like, okay, maybe... You know, obviously bigger engines are going to need a bigger capacity oil filter. But if it's the same size engine or a similar size engine, you don't need to change the capacity of the oil filter. And if you weren't having problems with the original part, why do you need to change it, right? You don't need to change shit that's not fucked up. Um, I do know that emissions did play a part in changing oil. Part of the reason why... Uh, diesel engine oil is different than it was is because of emissions because as we all know in a combustion engine you do get some oil up the cylinder wall that burns might just be a little bit but every engine has just a little bit of oil that gets past the rings and burns in the combustion chamber um, if it's just a pickup truck it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> truck yard pickups baby do you have a sweet ass blue cloud of smoke every once in a while yeah <laughs> oh god like when I don't start it for a couple weeks yeah it's fine it's a diesel it's fine no it's not 
I really hate to break it to you, but rolling coal and rolling blue smoke is not the same thing. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, you know. But you know, the reason they, they changed the oil, and this is also the same reason they changed diesel fuel, was because of the emissions, because the filters could not handle the additives in that. That's why they had to change the ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. That's why they had to change to a different engine oil was because some of the additives in those engine oils were contaminating or poisoning the exhaust filters because the exhaust filters have like the the doc for example and the scr system and all that shit they all have very specific metals in them actually like minerals and shit they're they're like really really specific fancy fucking collection of metals and minerals in there to knock down your nox and convert NOx. So, you know, but that also causes a problem with older stuff that were pre-emissions. You have to run it. You have to treat your fuel system. Actually, you should treat your fuel system. If you are running ultra low sulfur diesel fuel, which good luck finding anything else. Cause that is actually part of the lubrication in diesel fuel and the newer engines are designed to not need that. The older engines still need that. So it's a good idea to treat any kind of fuel system that is pre-emissions with a fuel system treatment and an additive for your injectors. But it's, so things with, with like mechanic, like machine parts, I don't know. It would be really hard to be able to keep up with technology and keep up with making things bigger, better, fatter, uh, if we kept the same parts for everything. Uh, now, oil filters and shit like that, fuck yeah. And do we need to change oils all the time? I don't see why, unless there's a reason, like John Deere skidsters can't start, so they start putting uh, 0 40 engine oil, or 540 engine oil in their engines, in their skid steers, because they couldn't fucking keep, get them started in the wintertime, but... I don't know if that kind of, I know my opinion might not quite match that, but I, it's that, that's another one where it would be a really cool idea, but I don't see how it's possible with a lot well, of things. I think, so I, ISO 9000 and a bunch of other these standardized um, systems to create standard products. So uh, Bosch makes fuel injectors for lots of different cars. Yeah. and car manufacturers and and so they in theory could use the similar injector on multiple manufacturers and, and across multiple cars uh and the only thing that's going to make that happen is either bigger government which i'm not huge for or um you know the requirement to say and this is also kind of big government to say uh that you have to supply those parts for so many years. You, if you're going to have a vehicle that you're going to have this fuel injector in, you have to be able to supply that fuel injector for that 10 years. And if they do that across all equipment, including uh, IT stuff like cell phones, if they say, okay, Apple, you got to have all the parts to repair this phone for 10 years, which seems crazy right now because nobody keeps a phone more than two years, uh, that would... Uh, require them, they would have to, as a business model, they'd have to look at standardizing uh, some parts and not having so many different ones. And then then that would, again, allow the aftermarket to to make them because uh, they could reverse engineer them. Um, I'm just trying to think of different ways that we can make it so these this equipment is repairable. And again, that's the right to repair ideas that everything should be able to be repaired. And, and now we're getting to the point where clothes washers and appliances of all types are throwaway, which I don't like that. Well, we live in a throwaway culture. Yeah. You know, people buy a new car every two years. Once the warranty's out, they get a new car. You know, yeah. and we live in, we live in that culture. Um, you know, but do we there, accept it? Are we going to accept it is the thing. I mean, 90% of the population probably is because they don't want to fucking fix it. 
They yeah. ain't gonna fucking put the time in. They ain't gonna do it. You know, I I can't tell you how many appliances I've gotten and bought from people that are broken and I fixed it in like three minutes and it was fine. Um, but it, you, you can't, you know, that, that's something that I would love to see change as a society, but you know, we live in a society where like everybody, your daughter's age, Hey, nobody wants to fucking do any of that. Nobody but her wants to do that. You know? <laughs> but it, it, it's just getting worse and worse, getting rarer and rarer. And the technician shortage is so much bigger than just we need technicians. It's that the entire culture and the entire thing of everything is a throwaway culture. And mm-hmm. trying to get people to understand that, like, you know, you still need people to repair this stuff. You know, we don't have the bodies to repair what we have, let alone more. And it's it's sad because then it's hard to start a business because then you end up, you know, you can do the work yourself, right? You can do it. But where the fuck are you going to find help? So how the fuck do you expand when you can't find help? Um, and then obviously you have the whole challenges of the right to repair. And you have the challenges of fighting parts and fighting specialty tools and all that stuff. And it's a hard world to be in. But, you know, back to the parts thing. I mean, if you could get John Deere to pick one oil filter, I would be impressed. Like, if you could get John Deere to decide on one thing and stay that way, I would be impressed. But, and you would think it would be more cost effective for them to do that, but they got to keep up with what's Caterpillar doing, right? What's Komatsu doing? What are they doing? How are they doing it? And it's, so there, there's const, a constant change of equipment and that, healthy competition we were talking about earlier about repairing stuff is also a part of the, the reason why our shit changes all the time because everybody wants to be the latest and greatest and best shit why that has to be included with the oil filter i don't know but it does apparently <laughs> so i would love to see that i think you know we saw a huge parts issue in 2020 we couldn't get fucking fuel filters we couldn't get oil filters, couldn't get fucking fuel filters. It was a disaster trying to get parts because no one was working in the John Deere warehouses to ship any of it out. But, you know, would it be helpful if John Deere standardized some of their filters? Yeah, probably. And some of these, yeah. but it's, I mean, good luck. I, I wish, I wish, but, you know, these guys are way more focused on being the latest and greatest than they are about yeah, you Do know. Also, I think after talking about to Melissa, I think we need to find the old style gasket making kit for you know oh my God. the punches and the and the special cutout stuff and all that, so she can make her gaskets. Because that would be a funny like next year Christmas <laughs> present. But when we were talking about gaskets, it just made me think about like all the generators that we've taken apart, and somebody did just form a gasket and just like. Mmm. And it was horrible. So when you said that, I was like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> there, there is a time and a place. For yeah, form not on everything. Uh, not- yeah, I had a boss at one point in time try and get another technician to do that on a valve. Because we couldn't find the part and we or we couldn't get the part in time. And it's like, bro, no. See all those little tiny holes? Bad things happen when you clog those. So let's yeah. find the actual gasket. Yeah. Um, yeah. John Deere has, I love John Deere gasket makers. Probably. I'm a little biased. That's all I fucking ever worked on, but they've got like high flux gasket maker and shit like that, that they actually use for like axle flanges, oil pans, shit like that. But yeah, there's a time and a place for RTV and gasket maker and comes in a can about this big it's got a giant paintbrush and you just <laughs> smear that crap on there oh the the um aviation gasket makers like that or the like the gasket dressings and shit yeah I have some of that yeah it's lovely I love gasket dressings. oh yeah what a mess to take yeah off. you're like getting the little chisel thing in there like oh yeah this is great man it's horrible. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. That's why you get a fucking <laughs> die grinder with a pad on it and you take that shit off with that because I am not fucking sitting. I have done that before. I've sat there with a fucking razor blade fucking 
trying to get that shit off. And yeah, it takes for it takes years. And fuck that. So I, I learned power tools are my best friend with that. So I don't I don't take a gasket off. Like if it's so on some older shit, it's like really fucking hardened onto one side, especially like oil pans. For some reason, John Deere, I don't do this, but John Deere tells you to only put gasket maker on one side, on some of them. It's like, Hmm. they only want you to put it on one side, or it's like, they only want you to put it on the corners. And it's only supposed to be on the block where the rear main CO housing meets the block. There's a gap there. So they have you put gasket maker there on the front. It's the same. With the timing cover, they have you put gasket maker right there. I put it all the way around the front edge of the engine and all the way around the back edge of the engine on both sides. But when that shit hardens, trying to take that off is a fucking bitch. So I I use the fucking die grinder with a buffer wheel to take that shit off. I scrape the big shit off with a scraper and then I, because it's so, it'll harden. Like if it's on there too long, the gasket will harden onto that and then you're sitting there and you're trying to chisel it away <laughs> with a fucking chisel and you get like that much off every yeah. five minutes and it's so maddening it's so yeah i don't know so, that. So speaking of the adhesives and stuff like that um in the, the cell phone i just try to do a new uh, battery and uh screen on my my phone how'd that work and out for you that glue and shit is unbelievable I mean, so hard to work with where, you know, I had a old Samsung phone. You just snap the back off, put a new battery in and off you went. It was really easy. So that's another part of the the right to repair is they, uh, a lot of the cell phone manufacturers are using glass backs. uh, And I haven't heard of a good reason why they're using them besides the idea that the average guy can't just replace his battery or whatever. So, um, God, you sound like my father. Oh yeah, see you, you know what the rest like of the world does theorist. when their you know what the rest of the world does when their battery and their cell phone goes out? We get a new right. cell phone. No, oh, come <laughs> on, you guys. That's part of the problem. That's right to repair. He didn't get a phone case, so we had to put tape on the back of his I phone. See that. I see that. It's too slippery. That's DIY, buddy. <laughs> yeah, but, but you should have seen us and take that off it was like wow this is this could not be going worse right now right, so, so if you made if you designed it if the engineer so i love the dog engineers but engineers designed it in a way that it's unserviceable and this happens with equipment and cars and motorcycles and everything well the, the little dude in that you you break i fix can do it yeah, yeah that's true. who we follow but he's really good yeah we're not that good <laughs> jerk not on this no but again it, it's it's i, I think everything you know, including heavy equipment. I know, like, say, the Subarus that we, you know, put the engines in and that kind of stuff. All those stupid clips are designed to not be serviceable. They just break. And you're supposed to buy new clips. And it's not a big deal, but if you don't have the clips, you can't stick that stuff back together. Tape. Tape. So why did we manufacture – why did the engineers come up, come up with that? Because it's cheap and whatever. Well, if, think- if you If you – engineer stuff to be serviceable that's that's a i think the last component i can think of of the right to to repair is that it has to be designed engineered to be serviceable not and, and you guys are younger than me so you're like oh i just buy a new phone i'm like no i just want to snap a new battery in and move on and i don't know when i've said that but mine got run over by you a damn skid kids <laughs> mine got run over by a skid steer he's like oh you think it still works mm, no but okay I've ran mine over with a grader before, so. And dropped one in oil, didn't you? Yes. I That one lived, though. That was a work phone. That one lived. It had it a lived? box case on it. Yep, it lived. You show up on TikTok, but I have ran over one with a grader before, and that one did not live. That yeah. was a personal one, though. Also, something I wanted to say that you touched on was like, oh, engineers shouldn't design it like this, but the engineers are getting paid by the manu- by the like the people that own the company to make it not fixable. It's not the engineers. Oh no, it's the engineers. They're out to get me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're here to destroy your life. That's right. They are. They are. Some some mechanic, some field mechanic uh had an affair with an engineer's wife and we're paying the fucking price for it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I did I had to figure out how to say that a little bit better than shop talk would say that. But um yeah, it's engineers. Once you become a mechanic, you are gonna hate every engineer on the fucking planet and you're gonna wanna fucking burn all of them in your sleep. Um no, Toyo- <laughs> the one I stand by is Toyota, I think it's FJ. Whoever made that car, when you take the oil filter off, it has a little like a little psh, and it goes down and then drains right into the pan. But I put the pan in the wrong spot, but it does drain right into the pan if you do it right. Yeah, their little engineers seem to be pretty decent yeah, about it. They're like, they're, hey, they're still let's serviceable, do it the right, right way. There's there's yeah, some yeah. things, but and it's right know. on the top. It's right on the top. It's so easy to get to. I didn't even need to stand on like a stool or anything. Just like reach How over. Old is this? What? How old is this car or whatever you're working on? 2008, I think. Yeah. 14. Yeah, it's part of your problem. 2022. Well, I guess 2014 is not bad, but like all the all the new shit is like you got to take apart half the fucking machine. Take it to That's one thing. True. You ever tried to split a tractor before? To do an oil pan, that was cool. You got yeah. take out the entire fucking like you got to strip it down to like nothing just to do an oil pan gasket on like a six thousand series tractor. That's terrible. Uh, big tractors don't have frame rails, which uh, I need to remember to talk to this camera. Big cameras don't have frame rails; they are an engine bolted to your axle housing, which is bolted directly to your transmission, which is bolted directly to a spacer housing, which is then bolted directly for to a pump drive housing, which is then bolted directly to the rear axle. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, so hey, my, my truck can just like four bolts and everything's are out. Like you can see everything, take everything apart. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I, I have spent lots of time cursing engineers like why the why, why does this need to be? And there's so many things to where like it would be a five minute repair if you could get all the bolts out, but you can't. Yeah. When you become a mechanic, invest in if you buy ratcheting wrenches, make sure you buy ones that are reversible with a little switchy thing. <laughs> okay. You know why? Because you back them out and then you're stuck. You can knock it out and you can't get it off. Because I've done that before, actually. That, yeah. yeah, I was I was working on a lawnmower and it got stuck between. I'm like, what's my next step? Like, <laughs> take I can't. The rest of it. No, I just yanked it out. It was my tool. It was his. So I just like freaking <laughs> talked well, on got, it out. <laughs> you got lucky. You could yank it out because Didn't you I've get the electric ratchet stuck ratchet. too. That's what I'm talking about. The electric ratchet because the thing's on the back of the the, the spinny part and then it got stuck. Yeah. That's okay. It's not my tools. If it's his tools, I'll just yank it out of there. But, you know, if it's mine, I'd like to figure out a better way to do that. But, you know, make sure I don't have a second that. electric ratchet, so I can't take <laughs> the other pieces off. <laughs> oh, Lord. Don't do that to a mechanic's tools in the shop, or you'll get no, a fucking whoop for that. Shit. Him. It's okay. just him. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, you've probably ruined your dad's tools or lost them. You know, honestly, I did not wrench with my dad that much when I was younger. Oh, okay. Do you put your tools away, though? Because that's his one of his biggest things with me is I don't put tools away when I'm done. No. They just sit on the table for the next week until I use them again. <laughs> what do I look like? The tool monkey that puts yeah. all the tools away? <laughs> it's your shop. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I uh, am not very proud to say that I... Don't put my tools away. I am so bad about that. I now when I worked in a shop, okay, hold on before dad piss, gets mad at me. When I worked in an actual shop and like at the dealerships, they made me. They would make me. He, they will be on your ass like every day to clean up your shit because it's a dealership, right? Or it's a shop. They want it to look nice. They don't want customers coming in and being like, "What the fuck is this person's entire toolbox doing out on the floor?" Um, but. Now that I have my own shop and I'm doing my own shit, I have had stuff out for the last four months that I have not put away yet. So that's put your shit away, though. Also, you can't tell her about uh, tool bench bankruptcy. Oh, workbench bankruptcy. You probably you know exactly what I'm talking about. Is like we have an issue with shop like table space. Because we've got, I think, four or five. leave all the tools out. Shut up. We've got four <laughs> or five toolboxes and then a workbench that's, like, for welding. Just, like, 
What? How long is the shop? It's the same length of the width. Twenty four feet deep. We've got twenty four feet of freaking table space, and it's always full. And so you just take a giant Home Depot bucket and you shovel all of the stuff into the Home Depot bucket, and then you put the bucket in the back corner and sort through that when you you get a chance. But that's when, like when is that chance? When are you gonna? Sort when you that lose bucket? a freaking bolt that you need, <laughs> that's when you go through Perfect. the box. But yeah, it's called workbench bankruptcy, and it's lovely. It happens like once a month. And they just claim bankruptcy on the workbench and just dump it all. Over. Yeah, it's great. I uh. We had this wash hand at Onan in Commerce City. Did you ever meet Ryder? Probably not. Have you ever been to the Commerce City Onan shop? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they had this wash guy named Ryder. I was going to spare you the details of who this guy is because I'm trying to figure out how to say it was politically correct. <laughs> Ryder was borderline, I'm not sure. He, like, he was legal. But barely. If he was legal, it was barely, right? Like, it, he struggled with English. English was not his forte. Actually, he knew English. He just pretended like he didn't sometimes when he didn't want to do something. That was cool. But, he, no, I'm serious. I'm not kidding you. But he would be told, right? He'd come and be like, I, he'd be told, like, he doesn't have anything to do. He refused to use computer, so we called the power washer his computer, and he'd say, computer's broke. Okay? So, while well, somebody else is trying to fix the power washer, which is usually just no ring, maybe tell him to clean. Well, I like Ryder. He's cool, but that doesn't mean... So, he would take... He would do the same thing. He would take everything on top of your bench, your tools, all your parts, all your bolts, everything into the trash. Or he would pick it. We don't throw it away. It's in a bucket. <laughs> it's in a bucket. And sweep it into this. We had like these big giant floor pits at in the Commerce City, City shop, and I can't tell you how many parts and tools he swept into that thing, trying to help. It's like I've done that too. We've got grates in the shop floor. It's like for a drain, and freaking bolts go right through the grates. This wide bolts go right down. So you got to take the whole floor drain out. It's like. A fifth, not 15, it's like 10 foot probably the floor drain to take up to get one bolt. Or like my uh, wood burner, the, the end of the wood burner. These I dropped that in like, there every single time. It's horrible. These pits were probably five feet deep oh. and like as wide as my, if for floor dry, yeah, like we had to pick them up with loaders to unload them, right, and dump them out. So if you drop the bolt down that, you might as well give up. Uh, well, advice, <laughs> advice from a future mechanic: organize your hoarding junk. That is my <laughs> advice. Organize your hoarding junk. I spent three years, four years of my mechanic career with five-gallon buckets of bolts. Don't do that. It will make you. It will piss you off so much every time you need to find a bolt that you got it, and you're gonna. I know you don't know where this is going. You're going to dump the entire fucking thing out on the floor just to find one fucking bolt, and then you got to put it all fucking back in. Fuck that. Don't do that. Find a drawer in a toolbox and get a fucking the little dividers in there and organize and be like, okay, like biggest to smallest, right? Or smallest to biggest. And if, it, if you fill that up, the rest go in the trash. Quit hoarding it. I like the trash option because we've got some like they're little like uh they're this big. I don't know where you got this divider thing from, but it's a giant shelf and it's yeah. so full of bolts and nuts and washers that the shelf fell over. So <laughs> you can probably get rid of capacity, some of it. I guess, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's what it's meant that's, for. That's my advice is find something to organize your junk. Even spare parts, like find a way to like organize like have a cabinet or a drawer for like gaskets right and seal yeah. kits and whatever else and keep it organized because when you first start when i first started in the industry it wasn't a big deal right i was like oh i have a five gallon bucket worth of bolts it's like this is like like my little gold mine right i live off this shit because when i lose one which i'm going to every time i got it in here somewhere 
Yeah. Then about the eight million time you have to dump that motherfucker out on the floor because now you got two because you're a hoarder. You got to dump them out on the floor and dig through it. I don't have as many bolts as I used to. <laughs> but I know what bolts I do have and I can see them all. And I know for a fact if I got one or not. So I don't got to fucking spend eight years digging through my fucking bolt bucket to figure out that I don't have a fucking bolt. So, words of advice. Organize. Yeah. Organize that shit. We've got a you. Currently. They'll probably make you. Most, most, if you work at a dealership, they're probably not going to let you have a big giant bucket of bolts. Okay. Unless you hide it in your toolbox. I've had a couple of de- dealerships that did. They didn't care as long as it was like next to your toolbox and kind of out of the way. But the last... The dealership I worked at in Wyoming the last one I worked at was my boss was a little bit of a clean freak and there was no you you could not have shit like that stay so. in the truck <laughs> Dallas. Oh what did I just say stop hoard shit okay well that too but you know if you got to keep it weighs. in the truck <laughs> your truck is, rides like that it's so full <laughs> I'll just stuff. put the like six leaves we took out back in it and be fine yeah are you yeah. just gonna fill up your entire bed of bolts? That's gonna be your bolt. Uh, that air that's truck. A little excess, but I have I have a toolbox, and there's a tray in the toolbox, and I feel like that's gonna be full of bolts. Like I said, keep shit. Keeping shit's great. Seals, bolts, fucking little tiny fucking interior screws. You know, keeping shit like that that you find or you have or you thought this is what usually happens to me. I think I lose it. And then I buy a new one, and then I find it later. That's usually what happens. Uh, so yes. that's how I end up with all my bolts. And so keep shit. It's awesome. Like I, yeah. I have, I have fucking these little buckets full. These little like lidded buckets full of uh, in, uh, wiring harnesses. And I, I cut every single. I took wiring harnesses that John Deere didn't want back for warranty, and I cut all the connector ends off and i got one that's connectors and then one that's like bulkheads like ecu connectors and shit mm-hmm. i got shit like that i got a bucket full of fittings and these are just little like working things but i got one full of fittings i got a drawer for all my caps and plugs that are nice and organized it also helps you like with caps and plugs i definitely recommend organizing that shit if you're going to be working on hydraulics and stuff because mm-hmm. you want to keep track of that shit hydraulic caps and plugs are like gold in a in the equipment industry and people will fucking swipe them things so make sure if you loan if you loan them out make sure like i'd stamp your initials on all of them and it sounds tedious and stupid but do it stamp your initials on all of them and keep them organized so you know what you have and you know who you lend them out to because they are not cheap they look like they're just some stupid hydraulic cap and plug but those things are not cheap but yeah yes well then they get that's that's tying into that standard again you know the standard of um having you know bolts and bolts and screws are all standard they're standard sizes and stuff and if we had standardized um sensors mass airflow sensor maybe or you know there's a there's instead of i don't know it's by thousands of mass airflow sensors instead of that we had 10 or 100 well then you could have a few spares to you know what we used to call them test parts you know it's known good I have parts test parts. used and you swap it in yeah, I if, actually if still if have a controller have... in my toolbox. <laughs> it's a little one. So, again, if we didn't have that, you know, such a, if we didn't let the engineers redesign everything every time they do something, then we'd have some standardized parts that we can use to, to test, you know. So thanks, Melissa. We appreciate you having yes. us come talk. You're welcome. Bye, guys. <laughs>